Today I'm in Cornwall, home to beautiful beaches, cute little fishing villages, cream teas, rolling moors. It's beautiful. But there are fierce people here in Cornwall, or Kernow, as they like to call it, yes. So independent, they've got their own language. They've been at war with England for centuries and then the Romans before them, so I better watch my step. Troon, Troon? I thought that was in Scotland. Must be another one. Cornwall is the UK's most southwesterly county. It's almost completely surrounded by the sea, so it's no surprise that fish has always been an important part of the diet. In fact, Cornish sardines are so special, they've even been granted protected status. Mining for tin was a key industry here. At its peak, there were up to a thousand mines, but the collapse in the price of tin during the last century started the decline. The last tin mine closed here in 1998, the landscape still bears the marks of a once thriving industry. Today, Cornwall makes a lot of its money from tourism, and with its breathtaking scenery and fantastic beaches, it's certainly always been high up on my holiday list. See Michael's Mount over there? That looks really magical. I love pasties. Big ones, small ones, cheese ones, meat ones. I'll even eat those little fancy ones with beans and chorizo. But the one that really floats my boat is the original Cornish pasty. That's the Cornish flag, by the way. The humble pasty has been around for more than 500 years. Following the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 18th century, it officially became known as the Cornish pasty. Tin miners were very fond of them because they were the ultimate handheld convenience food. Some say they held them by the crimped edge, which was then thrown away to avoid getting arsenic poison from their fingers. But many old photographs show them wrapped in bags or muslin and eaten from end to end. The Cornish pasty was awarded protected status in February 2011, but this hasn't gone down well with everyone. Anne Muller of Anne's Pasties in Lizard is not happy with what the rules say is a true Cornish pasty. Intrigued? Yeah, me too. OK, um, Aid, um, over here. And um, I believe you, yeah, you, you want, actually want to make a pasty, right? Yeah. Shall I just give you a quick lesson and yeah, then you have a go? absolutely. Right, OK. So cut up a bit of pastry, but a manageable... It's a shortcut uh, pastry, yeah. yeah. a manageable yeah. amount. Okay. Yeah. There's been a big hoo-ha, hasn't there, in the last couple of years about Cornish pasties? Well, um, there's a... The, the... I believe you're not quite on the side of the Cornish pasty. Although you well, are... Uh, well, uh, I'm, putting, I'm putting it strangely. Yeah. You're more on the side of the Cornish pasty that you think is a Cornish pasty than the Cornish pasty people think is a Cornish pasty. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you follow that? Oh dear, it's the, 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 the guys who have gone for the PGI, which is yeah. like the status, like Champagne and um, Newcastle Brown, Eye, yeah, Brown like... Ale, that sort of thing, yeah. um, they've, uh, they've defined the pasty as only being a side crimp. And uh, that's kind of pasty fascism, really, because... Well, you mean like, you mean in the shape of a D with a crimp round exactly. the side? Yeah. Exactly, and uh, that's just out, as outlawing my pasty. Because you crimp I'm... on top? Yes, and I You have... rebel. Yeah. No, no, no! Well, I've been, a, I've been a rebel since I was five then, because when I made my first pasty, that's how I was taught. Now, I mix the turnip with the, um, turnip with the potato. Now, a lot of people call that Swede, but we call it turnip down here. Yeah. What do you call that? Well, it is actually Swede, isn't it? But it's just that you call it turnip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's why. Now, you're putting some chopped steak now, in Now, uh, this is skirt of beef. Yeah. This beautiful bit of skirt of beef, that is what we like to put in a Cornish pasty. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I believe the... Um, the new standardised Cornish pasty that has ground beef in it. Well, they're allowing mince, which is not on. Yeah. It's not on. Is it, right. is it, Janet? Is it, is it Janet? Is it? No. Is it? Is it on? Disgusting. Exactly. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Marianne, what do you think? Uh, rubbish. There rubbish. Rubbish. There we are. Are you both from Cornwall? Yes. Yes, I thought Yes. Yeah. Rubbish. Now, a little bit of salt and pepper, but not too much. Yeah. Just as if you're trying to get a speck deep of salt. Yeah. That's, that's how I sort of think about okay. it. OK. Now. Bit of potato on the top. Yeah. Okay. Right, and then just a little bit of salt on the top. Not right. too much. Everything cooks yeah. inside the pasty. Yes, this is. You don't put anything cooked inside. No. The, yeah. 
Absolutely so right. So the whole thing goes in the oven You're raw. right. No, this is the top crimp. I love the amount of the amount you get into it. I know, it's like a stew wrapped up in yeah. pastry, isn't it? You bring the edge towards you, over towards you. Over, I see, yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to do the end bit of that? or Let's or do try you want... that just so I know. Yeah, put some flour on your yeah. fingers. Oh, I didn't give you an apron. Mm -hmm. You'll ruin your clothes. Over, over. Together, over like that, yeah? Kind of. Yeah, kind not bad. Of. Not bad. Not bad, bad for a novice. Not bad. <laughs> See, that was my end. There we are. <laughs> 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 I'm not bad. <laughs> OK, time for me to have a go. Pity on. Is that too small to start with? No, you can make a small one. Yeah. yeah. It'll be OK. It yeah. really will be fine. Just use plenty of flour. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, who's making this pasty, Anne, me or you? Mm -hmm. oh, I like the way they're all just stood watching. Nothing like a bit of pressure. How am I doing there? Very well. No, oh, here she comes again. With a rather technical bit of kit. Right. Okay. So I'm putting my turnip type swede. Right. Yeah, turnip, yeah. There. We call it turnip. Right, put a bit of about two ounces of meat on, or however much you'd like, but you don't put too much meat in because the juice can come out and then a, a, a and sort of so a, will bleed out, go underneath the pasta yeah. and burn the bottom. Right, okay, bit of pepper. A bit of oh, pepper on there? Yeah, yeah, before the potato. Right. That's right, nice and lightly seasoned. That's mm -hmm. nicely done. Oh, t -t -t sorry, <laughs> a little bit of potato. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't paying, what? weren't paying attention, were you? Oh, oh. salt. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> Did I say potato? Oh, God, it's me, is it? Yes, you did say potato. See, I was paying attention. Yes. There we are. Now a bit of potato. <laughs> now bring the edges up together and press them together and make a ridge. Right at the top? Yes, at the top. the top. Well, yeah. yeah. You can go around the side. We're not... We're not discriminating, are we, in this shot? We no, don't discriminate no, against you, other people's pasties. You can crimp at any angle you like. You can go over... Squeeze you, it, you can, squeeze it. That's, that's it. Yeah, you you, can squeeze, squeeze you go around it. the side or over the top, but we go over the top. That's that's that, is, that is pretty good, isn't it? I'm bad, isn't it? <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> twist now. Just a little twist. Right, okay. Now. Like with flour your fingers. Would you? Yeah. Right, that's it. Which way do you Now, turn? inward, oh, over. Outward. Inward, outward. Inward, inward over. Out, over. Over, inward. Inward, over. Oh, come on, Anne, make your mind up. That is actually that is spot on. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Thank well you. Done. Well done. Well what, done. what should we give him? Yeah, what should we give him for Kill. that? A pasty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. A pasty. I'll go and get that pasty. Of course, a pasty. Well, I'm dying to taste one. Now, and Marianne decorated it. Oh, look at that, you put me a lizard And on Janet it. made yeah. sure it didn't get too burnt. Too burnt, so... Yeah. So that was not. a joint, and that's for you, Len. That's amazing. Yeah, well, Stuff you can up. share it with your family. Now, have you got... You see, you've got my initials on there, which is what the miners did. Yeah. That's true, isn't it? I think the miners yeah, did that. Oh, yeah, because true. they would have had their pastas heated up at the mines. Yeah. yeah. Used to do and they would have needed nine to... nine of us, nine of my brother's sisters, and we yeah. used to have individual pasta each. Yeah. Well, should I start <laughs> eating my... Oh, it's quite <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hard, isn't it? <laughs> I'll pretend I'm an enormous miner. <laughs> 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 it's hot, mine. Be careful. Mm. You're going to eat all of that for us, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then faint. <gasps> Always enjoying that. Mm. I'm enjoying that. <laughs> We're very proud of our it reputation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you deserve to be proud. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Very much. <laughs> It's been a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> pleasure to meet and you, you ladies. Yes, thank you very much. Well thank, thank you very much. <laughs> if you hold them fairly high. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Look at that. Wonderful. Isn't it a thing of beauty? Hasn't yeah. come out yet. <laughs> <laughs> I did say at the beginning that I was going to bring you some authentically eccentric people. And I think that was one of them. She was fantastic, wasn't she? What I love about her is she's not bothered about designated geographical indicators and all that stuff. She just wants to make a really nice pasty. And it's a Cornish pasty because it's made in Cornwall. Not because it's crimped on the top or crimped round the edge. This is the one I made. <laughs> Well, the main course is going down very nicely. So now I've got my eyes peeled for something sweet. 
Rosmergy cream teas. That'll be me. I'm gonna go and have a cream tea now. See you in a minute, boy. Hello. Hello. You Jane? I am. I'm Ed. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Now, here we are. We've got a Cornish cream tea. What exactly is a Cornish cream tea to the uninitiated? Um, it involves drinking tea, tea. eating scones, eating and scones. clotted cream and strawberry jam traditionally. Yeah. What's clotted cream? Clotted cream is made from very rich milk, which is produced locally, and uh, it's a speciality of this area. It's different to double cream, though, isn't it? It is. It's much thicker than double cream. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of been boiled at a low heat. It's been scalded, yes. Yeah. And, uh, scalded, allowed, been told off. Allowed to, <laughs> yes, <laughs> allowed to cool. And now, then, I put the cream on first. Is that a...? No, that's completely wrong here, because mm -hmm. we serve the scones warm, and, uh, and we like the sensation of warm scone and cold cream in your mouth at the same time. All right. If you put it on first, it melts into the scone. No, and so it's I'm not traditional it either. No, oh, I've got it the wrong way around for Cornwall. You have. You'll have is to it... do the other half the other way around. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give it a go. It's fairly well loaded. It is. <laughs> <clears throat> Mm, mm, mm. I love I love a cream tea. Now, big controversy, isn't there? There is, yes. Because I live in Devon. Oh, do you? Mm. Ah. We call this a Devon cream tea. Uh, I wonder why you did it that way around. <laughs> What's the difference? Well, is there a difference? Not really. It's just in days gone by, um, cream was more plentiful than jam, and jam was seasonal and was a treat. So you just have a tiny bit of jam on top and you lash the cream on underneath. And I think mm. that's why it's traditional to have the cream underneath in Devon, maybe. Mm. But, uh, but we always recommend jam first. I'll try one your way, just okay. to make sure. Ah, oh, it's a healthy, generous portion of cream for my arteries. Uh, well, most people who visit us are on holiday, yeah. so it's always a treat. Mm. No, it wouldn't do to eat it every day, I guess. Can I be honest? Yeah. You're always better. Oh, hooray! Hmm. I do get. I get is that what because you mean? Because the cream won't melt. Sensation of cold cream. Yes. And hot and, scone. And warm scone. Hmm. I thought I was going to have to fight you then. Oh uh, well, I will arm wrestle you if you <laughs> insist. <laughs> I was thinking mud wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you win. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Hmm. There's a video just passed called Ding Dong. Ding Dong. <laughs> So far, I've been particularly partial to pasties. Always enjoying that. Mm. Oh. I'm enjoying that. <laughs> and now I'm off to meet a master hedger to discover how they carved up the Cornish countryside. <laughs> Sorry about that. Heavy lunch. There's a cattle grid. <sighs> what do you think of me? Here's a little quiz for you. What's the most important thing on the farm? Hmm? No, not the farmer. No, not the farmer's wife. No, not the tractor. Not the animals. No, it's the walls and the hedges. Because without them, all the animals would run away, wouldn't they? There are 30,000 miles of hedges in Cornwall, and some of them date back a staggering 6,000 years. A typical Cornish hedge is a stone-faced earth bank with bushes or trees growing along the top. They're used to separate crops and livestock, but they also work like windbreaks to provide essential shelter from the Atlantic weather. Restoring and repairing these hedges is a highly skilled job known only to the master hedger. Colin Nan Curvis has been repairing the hedges on his farm since he was a boy, and you're gonna try to show me how it's done. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? You must be Colin. I am. Colin, I'm Aid. Hello, there you Pleased go, Pleased to meet you, what a cracking spot. Well. When you live in a place like this, you feel you become a part of the landscape also, you know? <laughs> yeah. It is it, an extraordinary it's... landscape, isn't it? Full of all these fantastic walls. Yeah, well, the walls edges. we're looking at here probably go back into the Bronze Age. Do they? When they built these, instead of building it in a straight line, they would have followed a mark. There would have been a rock on the ground that was too big to move, so they would have put a line to that and then found another one somewhere else and then right. followed that line see, yeah. to uh, take so them you, to you the use, next point. Use a big rock that's there already, it stops you having to move it. Well, if you can't move it, use it. Yeah. Preserving this part of Cornwall's history is a demanding job. Local wildlife such as rabbits love nothing more than making their home inside these hedges. 
and the maintenance has been keeping Colin busy since he was a 16-year-old boy. This is one of your walls. Yeah, I did that one wall. It must be nearly 20 years ago now, I suppose. It all collapsed. That was a, quite an old wall. And this is a typical kind of Cornish wall, isn't it? Or this hedge. is, this is, hedge, the, this is the traditional, obviously the stone that comes from this area. Yeah. And the way that we, you can only build with the stone you have. Yeah. And some of these stone are not the prettiest of stone to work with. Yeah. But we always finish off now with these soldiers, they call them, when they pitch them on their end. Yeah. And that's uh, how it all finishes the well, job off, you know? I mean, these things originally were also a form of clearing the stones off the field, yes, don't they? Yes, exactly. And the so. smaller the field, the more the stone they cleared. Yeah. And this bank is enormously wide, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's stone, either, anyway. stone either side, earth fill and all the yeah. rubbish stone I mean, will be in the that? middle. About three, four foot wide, isn't it? At the top. Well, a hedge, the guide for if you build a new hedge, yeah. if you're going to be four foot high, you'll need to be at least five foot wide in the bottom all to, right. to start. Because as you're coming up, you'll pitch your stone inwards. Yeah. And when you get to a certain height, you've still got a reasonable width with your height. Yeah. Because the idea is not to build an enormously high thing, it's to grow something with earth in the middle that yep. you can then grow a, that an actual real Vegetation hedging. will go on it, yeah. yeah. But the problem is, because I keep so many sheep, like, they, they, keep they compete with everything, do they? <laughs> <laughs> the hedges aren't just popular with sheep and rabbits. Over 200 species of plants and flowers grow in the gaps supporting an estimated 10,000 species of insects. Right, time to get my hands dirty. Colin's repairing one of his walls and I'm gonna help him. So what's the technique? The technique? Yeah. Well, we got all the bottom ones put in. As you can see, it takes loads of fill, so we got a, we had some a fill pile load there. of fill pile there. I just gotta go and take my shoulders now to bring through to finish off my course right through, you know? You get the height that you want in your eye, yeah. which is roughly there. Got a nice line on him. Yeah. That's what you've got to have, that nice line. That one's okay. That one's but next. If you put that one on the wall, I expect you'll find he's too high. Yeah. Yeah, he's too, he's, do you know what? He's too high, that one. <laughs> no, wrong shape. No, wrong. Oh well. Plenty more to choose from. And covered in cow poo. <clears throat> <laughs> now I got one in each hand, look, you watch. Yeah. That one goes there. Where's me line on that one? With your hands, no tools, just perm it underneath. And there's your line. When did you first start doing this? I left school when I was 16. Wouldn't go to college, wouldn't be told what to do by people. Yeah. Left school at 16, went to work for a neighbour. And there was an old fellow called Alec Martins. Worked on the farm where I went to work first. Yeah. And uh, he was pretty good with his stonework, and I basically learned the basic ideas of how to use the stone. Yeah. And then you've got your own pattern in your own mind, how you set your stone, and you become to either you like it or you don't. And I, I absolutely love hedging. I yeah, just, I can see you've got a kind of passion for I it. I got, uh, you know, it's, it's like again, it's my art. It's what I do. Yeah. You know, it's, it's practical, and it benefits the landscape. It benefits wildlife. And it's a boundary to help do farming, which is the other objective, which earns my living. Yeah. <laughs> Wonder if I could grow to love hedging as much as Colin does. Oh, I haven't made a very good start, but I am hopeful. Now, see, these are stones you've picked up, aren't that they? Was, that, no, that, yeah. was, that was one of yours. <laughs> yeah, this one is wrong, this, this one's this, wrong this, way around. This one's one of mine, though. Yeah. Beautiful size. Beautiful size, size is right, but you had none the wrong way around. Yeah. <laughs> He doesn't mm. like it. Getting dizzy. Nah, no, a bit too big, isn't too it? Too big. It'll, it'll work in somewhere else. It'll be fine. Yeah. In another place. Yeah, still not doing very well. I wonder what Colin's secret is. You've got quite a relationship with your bits of stone, haven't you? You have to talk to your stone, or the stone talk to you. You'll get to know yeah. which we drop them on the edge, and we'll see how they go. If they're talking to you, what are they saying? When I go to pick up a stone, I'll know the stone I want. Yeah. And therefore, it's telling me you're the next one to go in line, yeah. you know? You can't pick up a stone and make it fit. Yeah. You automatically pick up the stone that will fit. Yeah. And when I look at a pile, the stone, I can, I can read them. It's like the pages in a book, you know? That course, I'm looking for those line. They keep the line the same. Yeah. Whether it be that way up or the longer way. When you have a stone, you leave it go, it has to lean back. If you touch a stone and it leans forward, throw it away. Yeah. They always have to lean back. And that will give you the strength in the wall. That's not bad, is it, that one? Wrong way around, perhaps, but... There we go. 
How's that look? It talked to me, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one wants to go next. That's not bad, is it? Hey? When you look at that angle that's gone in there. Yeah. I think, he, I think he wants to be put up there and he'll come work in later on. Really? All right. Because he didn't have that line in the front. That was a good one, though. That one was fine. Oh, at last, I got one. Hooray. Well, it's a fantastic looking wall. Well, he's getting there. Yeah. I think I might have to leave you talking to your wall. Well, that'll be fine. <laughs> and perhaps if you had a bit more time, he'd be able to tell you a lot more, wouldn't it? Than, yeah. than how it continues. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Colin. Okay, nice to see thee. Cheers. All the best. Nice to meet you. Cheers. H. <laughs> That's cracking, actually. Great landscape behind, isn't it? I like it when people just really like what they do. I mean, farming is hard graft. And then he, as a hobby, builds his walls and enjoys it. And what a fantastic thing to have is your legacy. On the face of it, me and Winnie the Pooh don't have a lot in common. He's a bear, he lives with an eight-year-old, and his best friend is a tiger. But what we do have in common is we both like honey. We've been keeping honeybees in the UK for centuries. While they're being busy bees collecting pollen on their legs and nectar in their stomachs, they also fertilise crops, flowers and plants. In fact, it's estimated that over a third of everything we eat depends on the honeybee. To make honey, bees need nectar-rich flowering plants, and in Cornwall there are hundreds of different varieties of flowers. This fantastic honeybee habitat helps provide top quality honey that has a different taste depending on which flower the nectar comes from. But here in Cornwall, they don't just eat the honey, they revive the ancient drink mead, which has become a very popular Cornish tipple. Beekeepers Mick Jordan and Carol Allen have 200 hives containing a whopping 60,000 bees. Hello there. Hello. I'm Aid. You Mick? Mick. Mick, how do you do? Carol. Carol, how Pleased to meet you. Now, we've had a relationship with bees for thousands and thousands of years, haven't we? Now, how long have you had a relationship with them? <laughs> About 30 years. Yeah? Yes. 30 years, quite a long time. Yeah. yeah. Have yeah. you seen bees before, then? No, I've never looked. I'm really excited, actually. <laughs> Jolly good. I am, no. I mean, because I'm fascinated by... Because you see little bees wandering around in your garden with a little pollen, and then you see honey in a jar, and then I'm, I just don't know how that <laughs> happens. the missing link. So yeah, um, exactly. I'm oh, hoping wow. I'm going to find that out. Yeah, you've Absolutely. just found the missing link. Yeah. Am I? <laughs> you two. <come> across. <laughs> you are the missing link. <laughs> We're the missing link. Yeah. Before I make a beeline for the hive, I need to get suited and booted in typical beekeeping style. <laughs> so, luckily, I've got me snazzy socks on this morning. They're even stripey, look like a sort of multicoloured bee. Mick prepares the smoker. This tricks the bees into thinking their house is on fire, so they guzzle lots of honey and become sleepy. And sleepy bees are less likely to sting, which sounds good to me. There we are. Choo-choo. We're off. Marvellous. So now we're entering the world of the bee. We're, yes. <laughs> there are another 250 yards along the road. I'm getting ready soon, <laughs> mate. I'm, I'm going to leave it nothing to chance. <laughs> We've got the other essential, a hive tool. So that's for opening them and pulling the yeah, things out, isn't it? Yeah, you'll see. It's a nice specialist tool, that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, look, I've already dirtied my gloves. Oh. <laughs> I'm a worker. Oh, come on. <laughs> Mick and Carol have 200 hives spread over the southern half of Cornwall. We're off to make sure all's well at one of their sites, and I'm hoping to see the queen. The queen bee, that is. Sorry. Imagine, if you will, that I'm really stupid. I know it's difficult, oh, very uh, well. uh, but uh, in here, there's different kinds of bees, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. There are three casts. Yeah. There's, the, there's the queen, there's the worker bee, which are infertile females. Yeah. And then there's drones, which you might have a few hundred in a colony, a couple of hundred. And, and they're the, the males. Do? They're the males. What, what are they doing? Stooging around, eating honey, and, and having a generally nice they're life. They're having a really good life. Yeah, because yeah, they're, they're just, they're they're just the impregnating males. the yes. the queen bee. Yes, 
so once. This is like a perfect society, excuse me. It is, me. yeah. yeah. <laughs> For men. Yes, except that, that you die when you uh, mate with the Queen. Right. So Actually, on, on mating? One strike or... and you, yes, All one right. strike and you're out. Right. Do you know what? I'd still go for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, shall we um, <clears throat> see whether we've got any honey? Is, yeah. that, is that what we do next? The worker bees collect pollen and nectar from the flowers. The pollen collected on their legs is pure protein, which they eat. The nectar is stored in their stomachs and mixed with an enzyme that turns it into honey. And back at the hive, the nectar is regurgitated into the honeycomb. Oh, blimey, there's a lot of bees around here. <laughs> it's very, it's surreal. Bee city. Standing here with all these bees floating around your head. This is where they store their honey. Yeah. How do they make the honeycomb? They produce little scales from... of wax from their ab abdomen. They have wax glands. Yeah. Rather like earwax, I suppose, in a all way. All right, I see, yeah. So they're absolutely beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. There's an awful lot more to bees than I thought. In the bottom of the hive is the brood, or nest, and I'm hoping that the very special lady might be here too. The cross-section where, Where's the queen? In here somewhere. All right, you, do, you don't know where, she's not in a specific place? No, she's mm. somewhere amongst is these Is she a frames. huge thing? Well, she's got a white spot on her, so if you see something with a white spot, you know. So, but I mean, what, what makes a queen a queen? Does they, do they, they decide? That... They decide that that egg they're going to feed uh, with more food. Right. The, then, uh, and they... So it's an election? Yes. It's literally a hive of activity. There's thousands of bees in here and they all look the same to me. I'm beginning to think the Queen might have popped out for a cream tea. Where is this white spot going to be? On top of her head. On top of her head. There she is. She's blue, actually. With her blue hat on, that one? Yeah. That one there. And she's the only one laying any eggs? Yeah, yeah. she's the mother of all this. That's yeah. amazing, isn't it? Astonishing, really. Yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's laying, actually. Well, I didn't expect to see that. She's laid an egg in that drone cell. Good girl. Yeah. Push, she'll, breathe. She'll <laughs> have measured the, the cell and decided that this is a drone and it'll be an infertile egg and she won't fertilise it. Basically. All right, I see. So the unfertilised eggs become the drones and any she fertilises become the workers. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's incredibly complicated for a, a civilization of 30,000 people mm. to decide that only one person, A, should lay eggs and yeah. should then decide wh which ones to fertilize or not. Yeah. It's just bonkers, isn't it? It is. So apart from the Queen, who lasts maybe five or six years, yeah. the rest of them don't have much of a life, do they? Work themselves to death, the women. Yeah. The blokes sort of they, uh, have their can, way with the Queen and then, then get chucked you out. You can think of it really as, as a... As a a whole entity as a body, the colony is, is more or less like a, 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 a person or an animal, and, and the, Not the, as an the, bee, the bees are really like cells. Yeah. And I suppose the queen's either the heart or the brain or whatever. But it's probably just the ovaries in this situation. Yeah. yeah. Or the ovaries, yeah. <laughs> now that's them just being a bit frightened, so you're yeah. still all right. Yes, I can hear a sort of angry bee noise now. Just a surprised bee noise, I think. Surprise to you, angry to me. <laughs> well, whether they're angry or just a bit surprised, I'm taking that as my cue to buzz off. But before I go, I just want to get a bit of that honey to taste later. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. You see, immediately you, you've broken it. There's a bee there trying to tidy up. Yeah. Look at that. I mean, apart from the bee, that looks delicious. Go away, little bee. No, I won't. Yes, you will. Oh, I... oh look, he's covered in honey. So we've had our near-death experience with bees, and here we have our honey, which looks absolutely delicious, doesn't it? Is it now, still warm? This has run out because it was still warm from the, the heat of the bees. Mm. Let's get a little taste of this. Mm. I was going to say it's like nectar, <laughs> but I suppose it is. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It is bees' nectar. It well, is. It's regurgitated bees' nectar. Yes, and, and it's been processed by the bees. They've reduced the water content so that it, it's safe for them to store. 
Mm. It won't ferment. I could eat all of that. It's really delicious. Now, what you do with your honey is make it into mead, don't you? Some of it, yes. Yeah. Now, what is mead? I mean, we all, we've all heard of mead. We've seen it in kind of films of Henry VIII. Bring me another flagon of mead. But what is it exactly? It's a, a wine mm. made from honey. Well, I'd better have a taste, I think. Get in the glug. That's a lovely glug, isn't it? I have to say, I was slightly dreading tasting that because I thought it was going to be horrible. Well, not horrible, I thought it was going to be massively sweet and kind of sugary. And, uh, mm. It's so. about pudding wine, dessert yeah. wine. But i tell you what, the thing I really like is this honey we picked out. Can I say, it's the bee's knees. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's Thank really you. nice to meet you. And you. Cheers. Right, now if you could hold your things up a little, quite fakely high, so you can get... Otherwise... Oh, that's nice. Nice smiles. You know, the interesting thing about um, the phrase, the bee's knees, is that um, the bee doesn't have any knees. No. I think that's probably why they call it the bee's knees, because it's so special it almost doesn't exist. Kind of, it doesn't exist. Next stop, Newlyn, famous for sardines, once known as pilchards. But it's not the fish I'm after today. Good morning. Good morning. You've got exactly what I'm looking for. Heavy cake, or heather cake it's called, heather isn't cake, it? Heather cake, yes, yes. Yeah, what's the history of heather cake? The heather cake was produced for the fishermen uh, yeah. of uh, Newlyn in Penzance, the pilcher fishermen, and basically what would happen is they'd go out fishing and uh, as they're hauling in and chasing heather heather, the wives would go back to the kitchen and make the cake. All right, I see. And it was this cry of heather heather that gave the cake its name. Is it tasty? The Try it. Fantastic. Delicious, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Very nice. Is it very popular? It, it is proving to be popular yet oh, again. So I've never heard of it before. No. It's, it's a trend that died away for a little while, but yeah. lots of holiday makers are coming in and yeah. purchasing it. It smells gorgeous in here, isn't it? Yeah, eau de pastel. Eau de pastel. <laughs> very good. Can I take a piece? Yes, you can. Thank you very much. Go for it. Take one of these. Thank you, bye. Bye. <laughs> Got away without paying. Here in Cornwall, there's a very strong tradition of brass bands linked to the once enormous tin mining industry that used to be here. Well, there's no tin anymore, but there's lots of brass in them, our hills. The Camborne Town Band. I have to say, that was absolutely glorious. Puts the hairs up on the back of your neck, doesn't it? What was that tune? Paul Dice, it's called. Is, is, that, Paul Dice. is that a hymn? Yes, it is a hymn. Yes, yeah. by a, a Cornish, Cornish composer um, that's named after uh, one, of the, one of the mines. All right, I see you've got an yeah, enormous cup was, down that there. That was about, um, about a month ago. Shall I bring it forward? Yes, yeah. Oh, it yeah. comes to bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the royal trophy. And what's that for? Um, that's Blimey, you've won it a few times, haven't you? Yeah, it's the Western England. You let the St. Austell Band in once in 2008, <laughs> you slackers. <laughs> yeah, it's so every year in June um, in uh, a town called Bugle. Every yeah. year the band take part in the competition. Marvellous. Um, and the, the winning band of the top section wins that cup. Well, you played me a song and I'm going to go and cook you a bit of tea. All right? <clears throat> Thank you. Hopefully. <laughs> Right, today I'm going to make something called stargazy pie. I'm going to start with a little bit of butter. Smell that. 
down a little bit. That's enough of that. Into that I'm going to put some onions and some bacon. While that's sweating, I shall chop my eggs up. <clears throat> Not my eggs, obviously. <laughs> some eggs from a hen. Just roughly chop the eggs, because all the ingredients mix together when the pie is cooked. Marvellous. Here's my pie tin. I'm going to put these into the pie tin. Right. I think there's a sweater down enough. I like making traditional dishes that you don't really see on menus anymore. I don't know why more people don't make this. I mean, it's not difficult, is it? And I'm cooking it in a field. That's looking quite mixed up. Now I'm going to put some of me sardines, or pilchards. Now, it depends where you are in Europe, what you call these. They've uh, been famous for their pilchard fishing in Cornwall for hundreds of years. But recently, they decided to rename them the Cornish sardine. The tradition behind this dish is that a guy called Tom Borcock, uh, who lived in Mausel, was a fisherman. And Mausel was a little fishing village. And they went through a particularly bad series of storms and uh, no one could catch any fish. And uh, Tom Borcock was a single man and he went out on his own in a raging storm to catch some fish for the village. And he went out and nearly died, um, but managed it. And when he got home, he gave his entire catch to the village and they celebrated by making this pie. And the fish heads stick out of the pie to show you how plentiful fish were that day. This is the delicate, troublesome bit, which might go very, very wrong. <coughs> now this is the fantastic pastry that Anne uses for her pasties. Oh, look at this, this is gonna work a treat. He said, <laughs> before he'd actually finished it. What an idiot. Lovely elastic pastry. And then, the moment of truth. Come on, little fishy. There. Looking into the stars. Don't worry if you're not catching all of this. There'll be recipe details a bit later on. That's fantastic, isn't it? Look at that. Looks really cute. It's like it's just coming out of a duvet. Come on, little fish. Don't let me down. You're the last one. Nice. Well done, sir. Give it a bit of a wash with the egg. There we are. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you stargazy pie into the oven for 25 minutes. Here it goes. Here we are, gentlemen. I mean, you may not like eating fish heads, but <laughs> it looks fantastic, doesn't it? Lovely colour. It is beautiful, isn't it? So it's a pity to eat it, but we're going to have a, <laughs> gonna have a try. <clears throat> head or not? No, no head. <laughs> Marcus and Kevin look a bit suspicious of my pie, but I'm hoping it tastes as good as it looks. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. It is... Um, it is on the fishy side. It is. <laughs> because, um, because you're very famous for your pilchards down here. Oh, right. Or sardines, as you call them now. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's quite nice if you get yeah, it. Very nice. If you get everything together, it's quite nice, though, isn't it? Mm. Is there anything other than pilchards here, then? There's egg in there and bacon. Bacon and oh. mushrooms and. Mm. No mushrooms in mine. I didn't put any in. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> To find out what I did put in, 
Here's a recap. Melt some butter in a pan and sweat off the bacon and onions. Roughly chop the boiled eggs and combine these ingredients in the pie dish. Add the Cornish sardines, remembering to save the four with heads for the top. Cover with pastry. I got mine from Anne's pasties, but if you haven't got time for a trip to Lizard, any short crust pastry will do. Poke the four sardine heads through and brush the top with beaten egg. Bake in the oven for 25 minutes at 200 degrees Celsius, gas mark 6. If you want more details of what you've seen in today's show, you can go to itv.com slash food. And there you have it, a culinary Cornish delight, stargazy pie. What else have you got in your repertoire? What else can you play for us? We've got this like, like, Campbell and Worthies at, um, that we play at Trevithick Day. Mm. Is that what you're going to play well, for it's tonight? Well, it's Trevithick Day, yeah, it is. It's mm. a celebration of Richard Trevithick, who invented the um, steam engine, which, which powered many of the mines' pumps. And uh, they, have, they have about 30 steam engines that are there. And yeah. they go through the town. Right. Make a mess of the tarmac <laughs> <laughs> and the white lines. <laughs> yeah, and the band play, the band play Trevithick, they march and the steam the steam there was all behind the band. And, and whenever they and pass, there's the Trevithick statue in Camborne. Yeah. The old hoot as they go past. Fantastic. It is, it's, yeah, quite a thing. Yeah. Oh, well, will you play it for us? Mm. Yeah, of course. Fantastic. <laughs> from Cornwall. They didn't seem too hostile at all, did they? Even the bees were friendly. See you next time.